This is Cruise Control. Control. Your on-air automotive magazine with co-hosts Fred Staub and Les Jackson. Control. Everything you need to know about new and used cars. Control. Industry news. We'll fix or repair your car on the air. air. Fasten your seatbelts and let us take the wheel. Now, your ride is about to begin. Control. Because you're on Cruise Control. Cruise Control. Cruise Control. Hello and welcome to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. It's ours, too. My name is Les Jackson. The other guy you're about to hear is Fred Staub. There he is. And uh, we have, as usual, a ton of items to talk about uh, this week and a few surprises, I would say. Yeah, I would say so, Les. There's always some surprises at Cruise Control and... uh... We're going to start this hour with the Bronco build. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. It's been a long time since Broncos have come off the assembly line at Ford. And, uh, well, production started this week. And I think there's been a lot of anticipation for it. Don't you think so? A huge uh, amount of anticipation. By the way, the last Bronco that came off the assembly line still had a carburetor. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Probably, uh, what, wow. a 302 in there, I would imagine, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll get to that. And here's one. Uh, why are some electric vehicle owners switching back to fossil fuels? Uh, it is an interesting article. We'll talk about that. Yep. And uh, we'll talk about also the Honda Civic. The Honda Civic, well, the next generation is out at dealer showrooms. We'll have pricing and details. Uh, Great, great little vehicle. It is. I love them. Uh, And talking tech, we're, uh, boy, here's one of these surprises. Um, Are drum brakes making a comeback? Well, (laughs) yes, they are. Now, why is that the case? Well, Well, we'll tell you. Hey, you didn't use my line that I put in there. Not fade away. Get well, it? Well, I know. I, I apologize for <laughs> that. I, I should have said that. <laughs> um, but because, yes, now we're sort of implying that they won't fade. Well, we'll talk about that, and uh, we'll get into that. Also, I'm going to have an at-the-wheel review. Uh, if You may have been wondering, could... A large crossover, three-row crossover, could that vehicle get 38 miles to the gallon on the highway? Well, yes, it can. We'll have an at-the-wheel review of the Toyota Highlander Hybrid when we get rolling on cruise control. And Toyota never disappoints when it comes to uh, hybrids. They are the best in the business, I think. Well, you know, after selling... 10 million of them worldwide. Yeah. They're pretty good at it. Were they the first or was Honda the first? I don't Honda really remember. Honda was the first with the first Insight. It was only a few months uh, before the first Prius. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, it really is amazing what they do with it. I had the Venza hybrid uh, a couple of weeks ago. That too did great on the highway if you're interested in the two row. So you get, get your choice there. But uh, hey, I'd like to say I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Jackson. When we come back, we're going to tell you about the return of the Ford Bronco. And we're excited about it at Cruise Control. Don't forget to check us out at CruiseControlRadio.com. We'll be right back.
Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Jackson. We are glad you are back with us on your on-air automotive magazine. And uh, we are telling you a little bit about this uh, in the open, but Ford has started production of the Ford Bronco, and uh, it is exciting. The 2021 Bronco is underway at the Michigan Assembly Plant. They're going to build a two-door, less, and a four-door, the first four-door yeah. ever. Just listen to some of these numbers. They've invested $750 million, Ford has, added 2,700 direct jobs, the modification center where they're going to add things like the safari bar, roof racks, exterior graphic packages, and more is 1.7 million square feet. <laughs> Boy, could we park a lot of cars in that. That's bigger than both of our houses, Les. Uh, it's bigger than both of our development. <laughs> I, I believe so. I believe so. And... Um, yeah. And then uh, it's been 25 years since they've come off the assembly line. And uh, I guess that's 25 years since the first Bronco. They're not talking about the Bronco 2, are they? I think they're talking about the Bronco 2. The first Bronco was early 70s. That's <laughs> 50 years. When did that go to? Oh, about no, 69, I think. 75? Is that when that went to? I think around 75, 78. I think that was one of those vehicles that you thought like, wow, they still make that? That's what I thought. You know, it, yeah. it ran out and you just didn't realize it. Of course, the early ones were plagued with rust. That won't be a problem for this, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, finding a restorable early one uh, is going to cost a lot of money. And it, very interesting here in 1965, the Michigan truck plant, where they are building it now, Began production of the versatile SUV. The original Bronco continued through five generations and ended production in June 12th of 1996 after a 31 year lifespan. So uh, pretty exciting. Basically, near the end, it was sort of like a um, like a shortened F-150 pickup, wasn't it? It's really kind of what it was, um, you know, an, an assembly of on the shelf parts yeah but this new one it, it's great to see uh people working on this thing and and getting it out there and it's going to be exciting i think if you were working on vehicles for ford it would be kind of an exciting project to be involved with don't you i think so um and look how look how bright and comfortable that factory looks yeah we got some pictures up on our facebook page to check out uh, it does. It almost looks like a custom custom factory that you're building custom cars. Uh, I, I bet there's a lot of excitement. Uh, and it's got to be interesting for people building these things to, to, you know, start off. I guess they trained a lot and they build those pre-production ones. But uh, it's, it's got to be exciting. I think it's, I think it's good yeah. news all around. Certainly well, something that, you know, people will buy. How many do you think they'll sell? in the next year well like any of these vehicles i think there's a pent-up demand for it you know um and it will depend on how quickly they can get them out of the factory i mean there's still a pent-up demand well, for the c c8 corvette but they've had little troubles getting them out of the factory if they can pop them out of the factory i i don't know what the numbers will be but i think it will be uh pretty impressive it's not a cheap vehicle is it it's not cheap, um, and I they can make about a thousand a day. Think about that a thousand a day. A thousand a day of it's... those. <laughs> think about a thousand cars. Like if you go to a stadium or something, and and you think about parking all those cars. Think about building that all day long. Henry Ford, man, he he had it had it going on, didn't he? Well, he did. Uh, you know, you can't uh, you can't fault the guy. That, by the way, that's forty one uh, Broncos an hour. <laughs> that's, that's so crazy. that's one every minute and a half. That is amazing. That is amazing. One every minute and a half. 
I, I'm, I think about the F-150 where they, they go that at that rate, and Elon Musk kind of gave Ford a hard time, and the head of the Ford factory said, you want to see how to build cars? <laughs> Check out F-150s. One, one comes off the line, I don't know, it was every 65 seconds or something yeah, or like that. Le- less than that. I mean, it, it was... And the body panels fit right. <laughs> everything fits the paint's good by the way i was behind a model x the other day and i was driving behind it squared up i could actually see the quarter panel was out by three quarters of an inch i could see it because i could see both sides it yeah. stuck out like the fasteners were broken or something i wouldn't accept that i'd be like this is not finished this is this is messed up you know um, since you bring it up, <laughs> uh, I was walking, um, in the neighborhood yesterday and, uh, down a couple streets away, there's a guy, uh, in his driveway and he has a, a Tesla plugged in mm-hmm. and I said, hello. He said, hello. And I just kind of walked over and said, well, how do you like your, your Tesla? And he said, I hate this thing. <laughs> Wow. What were his uh, complaints? He said, everything keeps breaking on it, and it takes forever to charge, about twice as long as they say it will. Wow. So that's that's not... And I just kind of, you know, was sympathetic. Well, it's not. It's certainly not a good report to hear that it... Uh... Um, no, I, I, I would be uh, upset. Yeah, I would be upset too, so... Well, there you have it. All right. Well, uh, you're listening to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. Uh, I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Chacks. And it's funny, Les, our next story we're going to go into is about uh, certain owners, electric vehicle owners, switching back Mm -hmm. to gas. Maybe your neighbor would be one of them. Uh, This is uh, Uh, some interesting research here. Or perhaps... That neighbor will uh, get rid of it and buy, a, you know, a, a major manufacturer, electric or hybrid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, here's an interesting report. Uh, it was an article in Business Insider. And roughly 20% of electric vehicle owners in California replace their cars with gas ones. Uh, and this is from a recent study. The main reason drivers made the switch was inconvenience of charging. And these findings suggest new challenges for the fast growth of electric cars. Uh, interesting study for sure, isn't it? And uh, this is uh, this was a study, a new study published in the journal Nature Energy by the University of California Davis researchers Scott Hardman and Gil Tai, uh, that surveyed Californians Californians who purchased an electric vehicle between 2012 and 2018. Now, certainly the charging situation has gotten better, but still, some are not happy about the fact that there's very few high-speed chargers around. Well, but it's beyond that. It's also because uh, so many who buy these uh, only have 120 volt outlets. Now it's probably a 20 amp, mm-hmm. uh, but that's it. They don't have a 240 um, unless they have a dryer in the garage. So it takes their big complaint. It takes all night to get 35 or 40 miles worth of driving. Um, that's not good enough. If, if you're going to buy one, you really need to have 240 volts handy. Well, it's interesting on our second hour, we're going to talk about this. A lot of manufacturers are really thinking about hydrogen power, whether to power internal combustion engine uh, vehicles directly or to use it as a fuel cell. They still say you can make the vehicle lighter. If it is a fuel cell, that is, it would have batteries on board and all that. But it is, once again, that quick fill up of three, three minutes, three and a half minutes would still be a plus for uh, ownership. It would be better than all electric. And um, I don't know. What do you think? I think that it could easily happen. Um, I, I'd be happy to, to use hydrogen. 
Yeah, I also think it might be uh, the future for classic cars, too, that they could be converted to burn hydrogen. I agree. And uh, I always said they will make a gas tank that looks like the original gas tank, and uh, it will be like a hidden hydrogen system. Plus, there there might be new ways of storing hydrogen. We've talked about that, where you might it might be more of a, a solid form. Uh, you might not need the tank. We don't know. I think it's... Uh, I think it's, though, uh, uh, certainly something that should be investigated. Uh, we've had people on talking about fuel cells, how it's great for trucks. They can fill up quickly, you know, and have mm -hmm. a tank on board. So I, I think we'll see more of that. But that would kind of alleviate the problem that was mentioned in this study. Uh, and, and then also, uh, we've seen that vehicles are being able to get 85% charge, some of them coming out now in... 15 to 20 minutes that's still not three minutes but it is better than an overnight charge right well that's right um and the other thing is uh, people are running out you know they, they they read a lot about electric vehicles they run out and buy a battery vehicle and maybe they're not the right person maybe their needs are not really the best for a battery powered car yeah, no, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying for sure. So uh, certainly, certainly a good point. Certainly a good point. Hey, you're listening to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. I'm Fred Staub. He's Les Jackson. We're taking you on a ride around the automotive industry. Don't forget to check us out at cruisecontrolradio.com, where you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. If you're near your computer, check out our Facebook page, because we always put up a lot of pictures mm -hmm. of uh, the topics we are talking about. And one of the topics we're talking about is the Honda Civic. It is uh, the latest and greatest version of this, completely new, and it hit dealers this week. Uh, this is always a great value, isn't it, the, uh, the it Honda is. Civic? and always has been. Now, this one might be a little bit more expensive because the starting price on the LX is 21700 but still a good deal in today's world. And let me tell you, it's a destination charge under $1,000, which you don't normally see anymore, nine ninety five, right? Well, something, I don't know, something has to be done about that. I don't know what. Yeah, uh, it, it is, uh, it is uh, something that... Uh, I don't know how they, I think with fuel prices and that it's not going to get any cheaper for sure. But uh, we do have some pricing information on this and it starts with the LX with a two liter four cylinder 21,700 um, and it gets 40 miles to the gallon uh, in the city uh, and I'm sorry on the highway and 31 in the city. Great. Uh, then you move up yep. to the sport. Uh, with uh, still with the two liter natural engine, uh, twenty four thousand ninety five with destination. Uh, the EX gets the one point five turbo. Uh, that is twenty five thousand six ninety five with the uh, destination. Gets good mileage too. Forty two highway, thirty three city combined thirty six, and then the top of the range touring. We'll set you back twenty nine thousand two ninety five uh, with mileage just slightly lower uh, thirty eight highway thirty one city for a combined of thirty four. Uh, as I said, the base engine is a two liter four cylinder with a CVT free, CVT automatic transmission, uh, one hundred and fifty eight horsepower at sixty five hundred RPM, so not bad. Um, so I'm interested. This is such a strong brand, less such a strong model. Will it right. sell in today's, you know, crossover only world? You know, um, I, I I have my doubts. It'll sell well only because over seventy percent of the buyers are buying uh, crossovers. Wow, seventy percent. So it might not. It might not sell as well as previous Civic models, right? I don't think it will. Interesting. Uh, but it, I think it'll sand. sell okay, but I don't think there's anything they can do to increase sales. 
Well, you told me that uh, before we came on air that Accord hybrids were less expensive to buy new than used, right? They are. They are. I just was looking at uh, used prices. Uh, how can that work? <laughs> well, it makes in that case, I would go for the new completely because well, it's starting new sure. and it, and it's how much cheaper was it? Uh, it was uh, the one one that I looked at was a, nine, a nineteen uh, Accord hybrid, and it was it was thirty three thousand dollars, and you can buy a new one, maybe not at the same trim trim level, for twenty seven thousand. Wow, and even I, you know, you said not at the same trim level, but still, that's enough of a difference that you could certainly you know, spend a few more thousand and get a few more uh, yeah. and, options. And that uh, that 19 model had uh, 26,000 miles. Yeah, okay. So I would go with the new one, even with less stuff, because yeah, Honda I, I, always equips just, them pretty well. But uh, how, can this, how can this happen? I don't know. <laughs> it's I don't certainly, either. It certainly is strange, uh, but it certainly pays for you. Uh, I'll plug the show here. It is certainly worth it to listen to cruise control so you learn things like that because why buy a car with 26,000 miles on it when you can buy something with, uh, you know, five miles on it, right? And the, and the latest yeah, and greatest. cheaper. Yeah, yeah. With so. a full warranty. See, it's never that clear, is it, to say, oh, you know, I'll just buy a used or whatever. It's just, it, it's such a strange market in a sense that uh, it's kind of the a apple cart's been upset, right? Yeah, we're, we're in the midst, actually, we're in the beginning of the post-pandemic baby boom, if you will, of uh, purchasing. Yeah. And it's going to take probably a year to sort this out. But meanwhile, it's just, uh, it's the old west out there. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, you also have uh, the chip shortage playing into that, too. We're yeah. going to talk a little bit about how this could also hasten the demise of the sedan, because if you're if you have a limited amount of chips, where are they going to go? They're going to go to the high profit crossovers and SUVs and pickup trucks and not to the nice but poorly selling sedan. Very true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, we've been saying now for several weeks, if you're if you're planning to buy a car right now, don't <laughs> wait. Hold off. Just wait. Just yeah. wait as long as you can. Yeah. Till it sorts out. And if you have a pickup truck or SUV that you no longer need, I would say now is the time to try and sell it uh, because you will probably get a pretty good price for it. And, and then you can get back into something else when the market uh, comes down, if you have an extra vehicle. So, yep. Hey, you're listening to Cruise Control. I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Jackson. We're glad you're along for the ride. Uh, coming up after the break, we are going to uh, talk about the return of drum brakes. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, I love drum brakes. I always have. I'm not saying they're better, because they're not. But... I've always been comfortable with them. Well, well they're going to make a comeback. We'll tell you why. We'll also uh, talk about some new pricing from Subaru and what Dodge is planning for muscle vehicles. A little bit different. So stay tuned to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. We'll be right back.
Cruise Control. Welcome back to Cruise Control. I'm Les, he's Fred, and as promised, we're going to give you a quick uh, historical uh, retrospective on drum brakes. Oh, hold on, Les, I'm fading. Oh, I have to get something to eat. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Are you, are, you, are you sitting on drum brakes again? <laughs> That's right. I've been hitting my drum brakes, and uh, they are fading away. But you, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the return of the drum brakes. But you, you had a. Re- you said you love drum brakes, huh? I have always uh, lo- really liked drum brakes. I like just the the image of them sitting inside this machine, circular drum. I like the shoes, uh, the, the the forward and rear shoes, the big return springs. Uh, it's it's just so mechanical and it works so consistently. Not saying well, I'm saying consistently. <laughs> All right. Because uh, high speed uh, braking with drum brakes, if you do it once or twice, they'll fade. They get too hot. Well, uh, so they stop slowing the car down. Also, I think uh, why they discs became popular. Not only are they, uh, you know, they're less prone to fade, but they're lighter. I believe they're they're certainly easier to work on and to probably assemble right they're much they're more expensive the actual components are more expensive but they make up for that in ease of of service ease of assembly and and superior braking so why are they coming back well here's why this is according to an article in in gadget uh they are making a return they were by the way developed back in 1899 and, yep. and found them themselves on Maybox and Renault's, but um, they are making a return because they have less drag than disc brakes, and mm-hmm. they are better for regeneration when it comes to electric vehicles. And so VW's new ID4, which we talked about a lot, and their upcoming ID3 EVs will use rear drum brakes designed by Continental, and they have no residual brake drag, and they're, they work perfectly uh, with the uh, regeneration systems uh, on electric vehicles, so they can gather that em- energy. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Continental has worked on something they call the new wheel concept, which was an all-in-one disc brake and wheel system aimed at yep. the EV market uh, with an inner aluminum carrier star, uh, and an aluminum brake disc and an outer uh, conventional rim with a tire. So that never made it to to production, but it is interesting to see that this um, might be making a comeback, a drum brake, a more traditional drum brake. Think about it too. Um, typically they would put, in less expensive cars, they would put drum brakes in the back and discs in the front because the discs... Right. would be over where the engine and transmission was where most of the weight was and the the drums would just kind of be along for the ride in the back where less of the weight was but. and they don't need to exert as much braking force yeah uh, and and also drums when they get wet if you drive through you know six or eight inches of water uh they have to dry out before they develop friction although on the other hand they are a little bit better protected against like true the rotor doesn't rust or you don't see it rust the way you do on a uh you and i always say that's the worst thing after it rains and you got to back out of your driveway (laughs) and the rotors have flash rusted and uh you hear yeah the first thing you hear is a clunk when the when you start moving Mm -hmm. and they break free of being stuck to the pads right then they then they scrape well Well, here's the thing about the return to drum brakes. Do you think people will go in and say, well, why doesn't it have four-wheel discs? All my other cars had four-wheel discs. And will dealers be able to explain explain this? Uh, at, at the current level of training, no. Yeah, exactly. But then on the other hand, a lot of people, unless they listen to cruise control, will say, I didn't know it had drum brakes in the back. Uh, so I guess... 
you know, it may be a non-issue for many, but it, it certainly is interesting uh, why we're going back to what is perceived as older technology. And I wonder, are, which yeah. one is heavier? I would say probably... Well, I, the, the disc and rotor are much heavier. Really? That's interesting. Sure. That's interesting. Then the drum and, well, those shoes and the springs weigh virtually nothing. Yeah. The disc, or rather the caliper is, you know, those usually weigh two, three, four pounds. Yeah. And it's unsprung weight. It's right out there on the end of the uh, yep. axle. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another sedan. Uh, and that is the Impreza. What's, what's a sedan? Uh, it's a non crossover. <laughs> uh, the Subaru 2022 Impreza has been priced out. Got a few changes, more of a refresh for this. Um, great rear seat leg room, by the way. It uh, is. Yeah. And uh, it's got a few new things. New sapphire blue exterior color. Limited, now offered exclusively in the five door. Five door, folks, that's a hatchback, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you remember those things? That's, I still think. They make a lot of sense. And it's all-wheel drive, of course. They are all-wheel, all, virtually all, except for one model of uh, Subarus, is all-wheel drive. So you do get that. It is a nice little sporty hatchback. Uh, the premium model is priced at $22,195 for the sedan, $22,695 for the five-door. Uh, includes a uh, linear tronic CVT and adds a seven speed manual mode function with steering wheel paddle shifters. The Sport is available in sedan and, fi and five door models. Uh, and sport tuned suspension, 18 inch machine finished wheels. Uh, it comes standard with a five speed manual, Les Jackson, $22,995. Wow. Uh, and uh, you can, of course, get a CVT. You can get all kinds of good things, like a Harman Kardon amplifier and speakers, power moonroof, blind spot detection. And then the Limited is exclusively in the five-door uh, configuration, priced from $26,395, and includes things like LED headlights, uh, daylight LED daytime running lights, and 17-inch machine finish alloy wheels, uh, and they call it a thoughtful use of exterior chrome. Uh, what would be an unthoughtful use? Like having chrome strips run across um, your uh, windshield? <laughs> I guess that would be unthoughtful. I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, now that would be, uh, that would be a great car to lease. Well, that's interesting. Why do you say that? Well, it's an inexpensive car to mm. start with. And, uh, that I would guess, um, I'd like to research it real quick, but I, I can't. Um, I would guess <laughs> that you could, you could Sorry. lease one of these, probably the the premium, for less than two hundred a month. Wow. And it is all wheel drive, and it does have some of the capabilities in the five door of a crossover. Yeah. So it is certainly a crossover alternative, right? Very much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is the Subaru Impreza. And the pricing, once again, they're all all-wheel drive, and that's that's pretty cool. Uh, let's go over to Dodge. Now, of course, Dodge has made its bones on being the Hemi brand, uh, Hemis, Hellcats, and mm -hmm. beyond. But according to the Detroit Bureau, uh, one of the EVs, currently being worked up now uh, for Dodge will be the fastest Dodge ever, even beating out the the Demon, Challenger Demon. I think I think they're going to go for like 1,500 horsepower or something like that, electric horsepower. Or 1,500 pound-feet of torque. Yeah. Uh, and they're talking faster than the Demon. Of course, the Demon... Uh, g would do a zero to 60 sprint in 2.3 seconds. 
and uh, it was a fast car. I, did, I actually drove it on the track. It, it could run a 9.65 second quarter mile at 140 miles an hour, which, let me tell you, is very fast for a streetable car. It sure is. Yeah. So this will be even faster. What do you think, though? Will they uh, do something to get the great V8 growl into an electric car? I don't know. I don't think so. I I think part of the charm is this thing just takes off quietly. Either that or they will find the coolest noises in the electric drivetrain and put microphones there and yep. speakers. <laughs> Who knows? But electric muscle coming or, from Dodge, according to Or the sound system just has a repeating, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Well, you hold on because we're going to be back with an at-the-wheel review of the Toyota Highlander Hybrid. Stay tuned. Cruise Control coming up.
Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control. I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Jackson. It is at the wheel time. Les Jackson, we love to review vehicles and talk about them and drive them in the wild. And this time around, it is the 2021 Toyota Highlander Hybrid. I had a good opportunity to take this out on the highway. And Les Jackson, it is a large... I would say fairly large, three-row CUV. It is It is uh, hefty. I got 38 miles to the gallon on the highway. <sighs> That's very, very impressive. And it was. it's rated at 34. I always feel they rate these things pretty conservatively. And I was staying with traffic, which means doing 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I was not in the eco mode. You have normal mode eco mode and sport i was not in sport i was just in normal mode and i loved it and the thing about this it only has a 2.5 liter four cylinder and with the electric motors it puts out 243 horsepower but due to the torque the instant torque of the electric motors when you leave the line with this if you have to accelerate Unlike many other vehicles that have a traditional drivetrain and multi-speed transmissions, this thing will go and will even chirp the 20-inch wheels. Isn't that great? Wow. Wow. And uh, without trying. And it is, uh, it is quite impressive. Just that mileage alone. I would tell, of course, like you, I always have the neighbors that come up and say, well, what's this one? And how much does it cost? And that type of thing. And I would uh, tell them that I got 38 miles to the gallon without even trying. And they're like, that's impossible. This is a huge vehicle. That's right. But I said, nope, it's possible. And if you really put it into eco mode and really did just a little bit of hyper miling, you probably get, you could probably get it to 40 <laughs> miles to the gallon. You, you probably could certainly uh, over a, relatively short distance well the gas engine employs of course like many vehicles the toyota variable valve timing intelligence system and uh the total horsepower as i said is a 243 horsepower system this is all-wheel drive as well let's remember that hmm. the transaxle mounts the electric motors coaxially rather than in line and that results in a lighter package less friction losses and i the other thing i have to say the way they've packaged this thing less the batteries under the rear seat uh the flat the rear floor is flat even though this is all-wheel drive so there's no hump whatsoever and it really i think probably drives better than many of the crossovers i've driven um in the recent weeks. I mean, the only other one that I think that I really stood out to me was also from Toyota. That was the Venza hybrid. But, you know, it's sort of like have your cake and eat it too. On the inside, uh, they had uh, what they call, uh, what was it? Harvest beige interior. I didn't know how harvest and beige. Nice, nice color. But it's a nice color. Uh, Toyota has upped their game when it comes to infotainment. Bigger display. Uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay finally, finally, finally are part of their infotainment systems. They have a volume knob and a tuning knob, an actual knob that you hmm. Yay, turn. Yay, Toyota. And they have lots of connectivity. Three USB ports uh, under the da in the dash compartment with a 12-volt. They also have neat things like a little shelf where you can put your phone, and they have a little socket to run the wire through so it doesn't hang out over the dash just thoughtful good good things nice. they nice. Ha they have um they have uh, uh wireless charging in the center console and then you could also charge another phone with a wire uh really nice finishes on the interior great jbl sound system with 11 speakers you know it's a great system when you can have it on low and you can still feel and hear bass and Good it sounds good even when it's at a low volume. And I think that's always the mark of a good system. 
I think they've upped their game with controls. They've done away with the little chiclet buttons, which were kind of small. You still see them on the RAV4, but this uh, this is really nice. It's got the, the wireless charging on a flip-up panel in the, um, in the center console. Uh, in the back, the rear seats are heated. Since this is the premium model, the rear seats are heated. You get all kinds of controls. Uh, for heating and cooling, lots of USB ports once again in the back. Captain's chairs in the second row, uh, very roomy. You, well, if you're not using the third row, you can put them very far back. It's kind of limousine-like um, room. I would say the rear, the second row room was great and very impressive. The third row, probably about average, but the rear seat was comfortable enough. Didn't really put anyone back there. But it was decent enough if you had to ride back there. Not a lot of leg room, uh, but decent enough. And uh, easy, easy controls to get in and out and flip the seats back down. And good storage uh, when the rear seats were, were all the way down. So high marks uh, from Toyota. Um, our color was, when it first arrived, I thought it was black. But really, they call it opulent amber which is almost like a, a, a root beer type of color, which uh, was quite attractive, especially, especially in the sun. Um, let's get into some numbers for this. Uh, the price before destination is 50315 The destination is 11075 which is not out of line with what, uh, what we're seeing these days. So really not a lot of options other than carpeted floor mats which were $316 I believe so 51,808 out the door uh, I think if you're looking for a three row SUV and you don't want 24 miles to the gallon uh, and maybe even lower with all-wheel drive in certain cases I think this is the way to go it to me it appears much more modern and higher end than crossover, similar crossovers in its price point. I think Toyota's really knocked it out of the park. I like the designing on the side uh, where it's sort of a, a bulge around the rear fenders. Uh, overall, I think it's great. I, I, I really don't have any negative about it other than I do sometimes find the navigation system on uh, the, the, the built-in navigation system Sometimes on Toyota, it takes you on a goose chase to save you like five minutes. Uh, I don't know if you've ever found that on Toyota systems. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, but um, I I just think that's probably the only negative to it. I I put a lot of miles on it, probably 400, 500 miles, and I just uh, I just really liked it. I think I think they did a good job. They have a new a couple of new things. They've upgraded their safety. Uh, systems this year and they've come out with a XSE model which you, I don't think you can get in the um, hybrid uh, drivetrain mode but uh, it ha it's more of a sporty model it, it's got some uh, sporty seats in it um, but I tell you the the, uh, the version I had the platinum version uh, is amazing platinum is the top of the range and I really recommend the hybrid. You can also get uh, you can also get a V6 model on this and just a regular uh, four-cylinder model. But I tell you, if you can go for the hybrid, Toyota does a, a great job. There, there's the V6 model. But uh, just really impressed to have all-wheel drive and to have all that capabilities is great stuff. Hey, we appreciate you uh, listening to Cruise Control. That was an at-the-wheel review of the Toyota Highlander Hybrid Platinum. And uh, don't forget to check us out at cruisecontrolradio.com for more information, reviews, and things like that, information about the podcast and more. Time for me to say I'm Fred Staub. I'm Les Jackson. We are going to see you down the road. Bye. Right.
This is Cruise Control. Control. Your on-air automotive magazine with co-hosts Fred Staub and Les Jackson. Control. Everything you need to know about new and used cars. Control. Industry news. We'll fix or repair your car on the air. air. Control. Fasten your seatbelts and let us take the wheel. Now, your ride is about to begin. Control. Because you're on Cruise Control. Cruise Control. Cruise Control. It's time. Welcome to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. I'm Fred Staub. The other voice you're about to hear is none other than Les Jackson. Hey, Les, how's it going? Oh, it is going uh, pretty exciting this week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lot, lot, lot to of, talk about. A lot of interesting information. Yeah, we're going to start off with a question. What's the most inexpensive electric all-wheel drive crossover you can buy right now? I think it's the Yugo Extreme, isn't it? No, it's the uh, Daihatsu, uh, whatever that was called. <laughs> XJ911. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, over at Nissan, uh, they shut down production of the Maxima, the Murano, and the Leaf. Yeah, big news there. We'll tell you about that. And it has to do with chips, doesn't it? It sure does. Well, what else? Yeah, exactly. And uh, we're going to talk tech. Hydrogen power for Land Rover, BMWs, and airplanes. Remember when, you might not remember this, there was a time when they thought, hey, let's make a B-36 nuclear powered. It was a bomber. <laughs> was a bad idea. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, things at Corvette just aren't getting better. Nope. We'll talk about that. And we'll, we'll also talk about uh, Kia and uh, their super hot Telluride. It gets a refresh, which is uh, great news for them. But I think if they kept it the same for the next five years, they'd still sell plenty of them, wouldn't they? Uh, yeah, uh, if, if you want to get a bargain, don't bother looking at a tell you. <laughs> you might not be able to find it. There are actually dealers right. marking up, which is, I think, the first time that happened for Kia. Exactly right. And um, we're also going to have a guest on, and the subject is one of my favorite subjects, which is tires. Yep. And there goes... Somebody uh, using uh, some tires. Someone's tire is going away right now. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Continental's uh, Marco Robello is going to join us a little later to talk about tread type, what it can do for you on the street or the track. Listen to this because it's really important information. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, this guy lives for tires, Marco does. That's what he told me. Uh, and we're going to look at a bunch of different uh, tires and talk about tread patterns. And, you know, when you go to buy tires... You just don't want to go in there and just buy whatever they have on sale or whatever. Uh, you want to research it, think about the right tire for your vehicle. And Continental has some tires that are very aggressive if you have a performance car. Some that are great for all-round performance and some that are great for mud and snow and all the rest. And uh, Marco is going to be by a little bit later on. He's going to tell us all about them, and he's just done some testing, too, so maybe he'll share a little bit of that. All that. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be cool to have a car that you have, like, six different sets of tires? <laughs> you have a lot every of type of driving. A lot of storage. Dude. Hey, we'll be back with more Cruise Control.
Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control. Lesson Fred, it is your on-air automotive magazine. And before the break, we said we would uh, let you know what the least expensive all-wheel drive battery electric vehicle is. Well, it's the ID4. Yeah. <laughs> I just I thought I would... Everybody listening is saying, okay, who makes it? Yeah, it's like, tell us already. Tell us already. Yeah. Well, that's that's Volkswagen. Yeah. We talked about and, that uh, vehicle a lot. It's It should be a big seller for them, shouldn't it? Yeah. I haven't driven it yet. Have you? I have not. I asked about uh, getting into it, and they said it's just not in the fleet yet. So Yeah, uh, same here. I'm in right now this week a uh, Jetta uh, GRI manual transmission. Wow. I have not seen a manual transmission in the fleet in a long time. Yeah, uh, me too. Yeah. And <laughs> it's uh, it, it's interesting. Um, a friend of ours was talking about her Accord that's a manual. Whenever she takes it in for service, she has to – they have to get the manual guy to that's, move it around. <laughs> well, same thing, you know, at a at – a, a parking lot, parking garage. Yeah. You remind the people this is a manual. Oh, oh, well, we need to call the manual guy, uh, Jorge, up here. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk uh, about uh, this ID4. Uh, it carries a price of 43675 and that is lower than any other all wheel drive battery electric vehicle on sale today. Pretty good right. numbers too. Two ninety five horsepower, zero to sixty in five point seven seconds. That's not bad that's, at all. Uh, you know, that's um, the uh, Mustang Mach E range. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, on the two hundred forty nine miles of range on the all wheel drive Pro model, two forty of range on the all wheel drive Pro S models, and. Uh, the towing capacity is 2,700 pounds with a brake. Yeah. I don't know how much, what it's like to tow with an electric vehicle and how much that decreases the range, but I'm going to guess it decreases it a lot. What do you think? Well, you need to throw a lot of amperage through the motor mm -hmm. to, you know, to keep the motor turning under that load. So it's going to be, it's going to have a very short range towing. So do you power up the generator on the camper and run a cable well, forward? Uh, hey, that's an alternative. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you're towing, how far are you going? Well, if you're towing a travel trailer, you could be going pretty far. I mean, uh, well, okay. now we didn't have a travel boat, trailer. We had a motorhome, but we would sometimes go 400 miles a day. Ooh. But that's in a motorhome and... I don't know if there's any electric motorhomes, but I I, I would doubt it because they're pretty heavy. I doubt it. And a lot of a uh, lot of wall-like aerodynamics. <laughs> so, uh, yes. I don't know, but um, that's that's where you and I were talking about uh, hydrogen, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Hydrogen power for Land Rovers and BMWs and fuel cell power, where you could basically just power the thing up or or fuel it up in uh three to five minutes so we'll talk a yeah. little about that yeah. a little bit more but you and i have been talking about the chip shortage uh, the semiconductor shortage and of course uh ford has been building semi building vehicles and then pushing them aside gm has been eliminating some functions like start stop from silverado just to get them out there uh but uh, nissan announced this week, Les, that they are shutting down production of the Maxima, the Leaf, and the Murano. These are vo uh, low-volume vehicles. They're going to shut down production of these for four extra weeks after the usual two-week summer shutdown. Um, and there seems like there is a plan to ease the chip shortage, but it hasn't been eased yet, has it? Well, um, no. And uh, the good news is, of course, the Senate uh, finally did something um, and they decided uh, to invest $50 billion into domestic production of chips. But, you know, that won't happen tomorrow. You have to build the plants. They take a long, long time. You have to train and that might be five right years people. out. It's you know, certainly three 
or or more. Yeah. Um, they're also investing two billion in older generation semiconductors. So you and I have a great market now for our our old Windows uh, Millennia <laughs> and Vista computers. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Uh, Nobody's talked yeah. about that, uh, digging up old chips and reusing them, but that well, is funny. Hey, but think about it. Uh, a chip basically has an infinite lifetime. Well, there you go. Maybe that's the plan for this uh, problem. Yeah. We'll go to the junkyards and get it. But, hey, when we come back, we're going to talk hydrogen power. So stay tuned The Cruise Control. Okay. Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control, your on-air automotive magazine. I'm Fred Staub. The other guy you're about to hear is Les Jackson. We're glad you're along for the ride on Cruise Control. Don't forget to check us out at cruisecontrolradio.com, where you can uh, find out about the podcast and all kinds yeah, of things. Correct. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We always put a lot of pictures up on our Facebook page, so you can follow along figure out what we're talking about a little bit later on we're going to have marco rubello who's going to join us the man lives for tires les jackson he's from continental tires it's he's, important stuff the only thing keeping us alive yeah, in our cars is the tires he's going to turn you into a tire expert les jackson i'm telling you you know i have studied tire technology for many years and uh, it's good news because it who doesn't want to go in when you buy a pair a pair of tires or a set of tires 
um, and know what you're talking about, or maybe you want to get a, uh, improve the performance of your vehicle. So Marco will be by in a little bit to tell us all about this stuff should be exciting. Shouldn't it? Well, yes. And, and I'm sure he can tell us, you know, what to look for depending on your type of driving. Yeah, exactly. So maybe you don't need performance, maybe whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll talk about that. But first, let's talk a little bit about uh, Jaguar and Land Rover announcing a hydrogen concept. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicle prototype will begin testing this year. They forecast uh, that hydrogen fuel cells will top 10 million by the year 2030 with 10,000 refueling stations worldwide. And this is part of the company's plan to achieve zero tailpipe emissions by 2036 and net zero carbon emissions across the supply chain. And of course, the benefit of this is these vehicles will be able to be filled up pretty much like the current gas powered vehicles, right? Gas or diesel. That's right. I've uh, tested two of these over the years. We both not, have uh, not, done not this. Land Rover, but, but yeah. hydrogen fuel cell power. Um, I've filled them up. It takes the same time as filling up the, the gas right. tank. Right. Uh, they drive great. I mean, you, you wouldn't know. You have no idea uh, what's powering it while you're driving. It just feels like every nice car. Yes. And uh, over at BMW, they are doing the same. And they're looking, they're, they're continue what they call their systematic research and development. The first prototypes are currently on the European roads. They are based on the BMW X5, uh, a, and that, that they're hoping a hydrogen power version will launch in 2022. They are doing two things. They're testing both fuel cells, hydrogen mm-hmm. power fuel cells, and then just hydrogen power in traditional in internal, internal combustion, combustion engine. engine. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and you and I have said if somebody wants a V8 engine, or an internal combustion engine, they can dr- they can use potentially hydrogen as a uh, as a fuel, and it's clean, right? It's totally clean, and um, all you need to do is meter it into the uh, engine correctly, which, of course, for a modern uh, electronic fuel injection, is no problem. Yeah. Um, it's it's yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're going to see the internal combustion wo- engine won't disappear completely. Uh, I think no. they will have a solution for retrofitting vehicles to hydrogen. Uh, there's also the idea of what Porsche is doing with the uh, synthetic fuel, which could have some promise too. Right, right. But I think it might be easier to create an, a hydrogen infrastructure based on gas stations, don't you think? Well, yes, uh, because the storage is essentially the same. Uh, The the pump uh, is essentially the same. It's just a special fitting that you twist on to your to your vehicle. Yeah, like what they what they call a bayonet fitting, I believe it just twists on. Yeah, interesting. So I think we will see this as part of the mix and you know, yeah, I, I think it's great. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I see no downside. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then uh, we have this news too. A lot of manufacturers are saying they're going completely electric. But remember, when they say completely electric, it might not be battery electric vehicles right, strictly. Right. But Audi has announced they want to be completely electric by 2026, uh, just five years from now. And What's interesting about this, certain um, luxury brands are kind of using electric power as a calling card. Cadillac, Mm -hmm. of course, Cadillac wants to do that. Audi appears to be doing the same thing. But remember, it could mean electrified, too. So it could mean for the time being uh, a hybrid vehicle, which, as you know, if you listen to the show, we think are, are pretty good. Uh, So the same over at Lincoln, they plan to electrify 
they're approaching their 100th anniversary. I think Lincoln vehicles don't get enough shout out because their interiors yeah. are some of the best out there. And I just think they just they kind of get lost in the in the moment, don't they? Well, they do. It's never been a big selling brand. Mm -hmm. um, and and they are they're lost in especially in the luxury car field they just people don't think of them yeah well they have great vehicles like the aviator and the corsair and uh we will uh, follow this as they plan to electrify their portfolio by 2030 but once again it might mean hybrids all the way around or it right. could mean hydrogen power or it could mean battery electric vehicles the other other thing about battery electrics you got to remember the batteries are heavy nobody's made batteries that much lighter have they no nope, no nope, not until we go to uh, graphene and other new technologies yeah talk about infrastructure to build those things would would be huge wouldn't it absolutely oh boy yeah uh yeah. so if you can refill your vehicle and use a smaller battery pack uh and refill it with hydrogen you know, maybe that's a plus too. Maybe it makes it lighter, more range. Sure. You know, Audi has talked about that. Maybe you just charge the vehicle up more and have a smaller battery. Uh, but maybe it is that you fill a hydrogen tank up and generate your electricity that way. And, and you can easily uh, fill the vehicle up. So it's a balancing game with the range and power and all that. Um, so we'll, we will have to see, but we'll keep you up to date on cruise control for sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Kia Telluride. This has probably been one of the uh, the biggest hits for uh, that I can think of, of any brand. Uh, and it was just introduced, the 2022 model. Let's, let's face it, there are waiting lines for these SUVs, aren't they? Yep. Oh, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it's the worst nightmare for a buyer uh, but an absolute dream for the uh, Kia people. Yes, like James Bell from Kia told us, he said, I wish I could have every vehicle in our lineup be like uh, a Telluride. But oh, man. It, he said he would be, <laughs> you know, he, he'd just be building, 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 building. Um, it sales, year to year sales were up 68%, Les Jackson. <laughs> uh, That's... Uh... That's about as high as you can go. Yeah. They're adding some features uh, this year, a 10.25-inch navigation display, fully automatic temperature control, highway driving assist to the LX and S trims, and navigation-based smart cruise control curve on all trims. They start uh, front-wheel drive LX uh, starts at $32,790. All-wheel drive LX 34790. Probably you'll be more up in the range uh, of uh, the higher-end trims like an SX at 44590 and an SXP at 46890. Still good prices if you can get them. But well, there's there's the problem, Mr. Staub. Yes, I don't know if you can. You have to add you know $1,200 destination charge and. I guarantee you another couple thousand added dealer markup. All right. Well, we'll talk tires when we come back on Cruise Control.
Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control. As promised, we are going to talk tires and educate you on what's going on at Continental Tires. And uh, we have been joined by Marco Rubello, who lives for tires. At least that's what you told me, Marco. And uh, I think that's that's pretty cool. You were out testing. I know uh, driving on the track and uh, testing some tires. And there's a lot of technology that goes into tires. First, tell us a little bit about what you do and what your title is at Continental Tire. So just like you said, people say I work with tires. That's what they say. I don't know if I really do. <laughs> but um, I've been working for Continental for eight years now. I started my career uh, as an engineer um, when I graduated from Georgia Tech in 2013. Uh, moved to Germany immediately after I graduated, worked for them over there in the several departments. Uh, I started with commercial tires, and it was small commercial tires with Van, uh, which is the combination of high speed and high load, which is very interesting because you don't see that often. Right. And then after that, um, I had a project, an assignment in South Africa, introducing off-road tires, and that's how I got introduced to off-road, and it's what brought me to the U.S., even though we're talking about UHP today. Then I went back to Germany and I did all the um, ultra high performance tires for Fiat, Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, uh, the FCA group. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, I moved to the US. And since then I've been uh, working with the engineering of uh, many off-road tires and also the motorsports industry. And that's why we have this baby today that it's freshly introducing to the market and it's our first 200 UTKG. Not our first, we have had one before, it was not a 200 UTKG. Uh, but it's our recently launched 200 UTKG tire. Well, let I'm going to uh, show some pictures here of treads, right? We've got three tires we're going to talk about. Uh, and the one you have right there is uh, what's called the Extreme Contact Force, right? And that is... That is correct. And, and that is like a, a, a track tire, basically, right? But it can be used on the street, some as well. That is correct. So it's a DOT-approved tire. You can use it on the streets. You can use it as your daily driver. There's a reason why it's called a 200 UTKG. There's a specification. They didn't. They want to make the racing industry more uh, competitive and that people from any financial income can join and doesn't have the restriction of someone coming su with a super fast tire. So the 200 UTKG is a DOT um, tread life or wear uh, approval. If you go lower, the tire is more sticky, so they kept it at 200 UTKG so that the tire can have a standard. And uh, we did it this way so that we can participate in the, um, all the autocross events, all the races that uh, require this tire, and also that you can drive it on your, not on your daily driver, you can if you want, you're gonna wear it faster because they were faster, but uh, you can drive it on your car on the normal roads and you can also take a tracking any, anytime you want. Now, can we assume that uh, that the composition of the tire and the tread uh, would not particularly be great in wet or cold conditions? Uh, for cold conditions, I would not recommend this tire to take it on winter conditions. That would be uh, not yeah. optimal. Uh, um, good phrase. <laughs> yes. So, in second, uh, we recently tested with Tire Review. Tire with a Y is a British channel. Uh, we're very close uh, to them, you know, magazine testing. And uh, the wet performance was impressive uh, for a semi-slick tire. So you can use it on a wet, depending on how thick is the film. So I'm not gonna tell you to go aquaplaning with this tire, but if it rains slightly, you can still yeah, you know, well, use it. But just like well you said, sorry again. Yeah, that I mean that that is better than I would have expected. Yeah, uh, for a car for a tire that looks like I would use it on the track. So I'm gonna get closer to the tire. The tire is interesting because it has two very wide longitudinal grooves in the center, mm -hmm. and this is what helps it throw the water from the aquaplaning out. And you okay. also have these uh, grooves on the shoulders that help for the water exit as well. Right, they're pushing so it the is water a semi -slick, out. But it has a lot of engineering into it, so um, it's not op optimal for um, rain, but you can handle the rain. Gotcha. Great. Now, Great. for our, uh, our audience,
audience, tell us about those stripes that are in the center. Are they where? Oh, that's very interesting. So the stripes are basically, it's like um, a serial code, a barcode on the tires. Mm -hmm. When we produce tires, uh, for example, this tire will be a yellow, yellow, purple, purple. And in the plant, it identifies the tread because the tread goes in the tire and we have, we produce all the treads at the same time and we put them on our storages. So then they know that the yellow, yellow, purple, purple goes into this specific tire that is a 245, 40R17. So uh, it's a barcode for the tread to go in the specific tire. And the machines identify the colors and know that the tread is going to the right tire. It, it's sort of like a build Didn't sheet for cars. You know, when, uh, when yeah. a car comes down the line, they have a list of everything that goes into it. And you want to make sure uh, that the right stuff comes in there. You know, the other thing, uh, Marco... Uh, is that um, I noticed when I was looking at the Continental site, you have a rim protector built into these tires, which is great. And what is that? Is that that's like the little ridge that's on the side of the bead, I guess, right? Yes, we do. So, by the way, the size of this one is a 225, 45, or 17. I was testing another tire this week, and I was confused with that size. But this is a 225, 45. Uh, 45. The protection flange is, and I would say seeing the tire is way better than actually explaining without yeah. it. So you see this edge here? Mm -hmm. So most tires have a, a, a rim protection uh, flange. Uh, then this is for you when you, first of all, it protects the tire itself because it has a thicker amount of rubber mm -hmm. on the sidewall. When you hit a curb or something, hopefully you're not hitting curbs. <laughs> you don't want anybody it happens curbs. though, it happens. But it happens. And then it also protects your wheels. Especially when you're tracking, you put a lot of pressure on that uh, sidewall when you're taking a turn either to the left or the right. So this protects your wheel from getting scratched or damaged. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it protects the tire itself because you have more rubber. And when you hit something, which we don't expect you to do it, and we don't advise you to do it, right? then uh, it's an extra layer of protection as well. Yeah, that's good. And that's not just on this extreme contact force. That's on some of the no. other tires. No. Uh, I don't want to say I. I don't want to say a percentage, but most of our tires have a flange rate. Yeah, yeah. We are talking with Continental's Marco Robello, the man that lives for tires and tests about it. Talking about tire tech. Uh, less so far, we've talked about extreme contact force, and that the idea there. I think you said it so well, Marco. Is it's a tire. Uh, let's say you have a maybe a Corvette or a Mustang or something like that. You want to auto uh do some auto crossing but you're not a big bucks operation and you're not going to tow a trailer behind you with other tires you can drive it to the track with this do some track time and then bring it home and it's good and that's a good scenario for that so also if you tow a trailer you can use these tires so we're in that segment that, that wow oh wow for okay. everything so it, it is it sticks to the ground the way i call the tire in a non-engineering way, is it's a sexy, bold tire that puts <laughs> rubber to the ground for maximum traction. That's Les, amazing. do you have anything on that? A sexy, bald? Do you want to? <laughs> uh, no, I, I can go forever. I can I'll go forever on that one, but I'm not going to get into that topic just today. <laughs> All right. It. We'll leave Next that. Next tire, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so let's look at the next. Uh, that would be, I guess, the next one to talk about is the extreme contact sport, right? From but back, just back to your point, um, Fred, it, it is a track tire. Most of the people probably who are enthusiasts and they trailer a Corvette or any high performance vehicle. Mm -hmm. This is a tire for them. In addition to that, it can be used on public roads. That's so great. it is not that it was made to be used in public roads and racing. It was actually made for those people who are real enthusiasts and they want to go race and uh, go to an endurance race, tow their car. But it also has the capabilities for those people who don't have a trailer to take it on the road to, the, to their final uh, destination or the racetrack. It reminds me of a friend in high school. He said, I have racing tires. But yeah. they're wearing out really quickly, and I think this was a long time ago, and I, I think he had Pirellis, and he was sort of proud of the fact that he was using racing tires on the street, but he said they were wearing out really fast. So yes, something like uh, this would have been good for him. Ha having done that <laughs> myself years ago, 
uh, with very high performance cars. I wore the tires out driving home because <laughs> of really soft, sticky <clears throat> so, rubber. Yeah, but uh, but you have a we we've got a little under a minute in this first segment, uh, Marco. But uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the the extreme contact sport. And uh, when you look at that, that would be I guess the middle tire, right? Yes. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how that differs and what that's good for. And the great thing is, you know, when you go to buy tires for a, a performance vehicle, it's a it's a big investment. You want to buy the right tire and the right uh, tread type for what you're doing. And that's what we're trying to help you out yep. with uh, this here. And Marco will be back to tell us more about what Continental's got to offer. So stay tuned to Cruise Control. I'm Fred Staub. He is Les Jackson. We will be right back.
Cruise Control. And welcome back to Cruise Control. We are talking tires, specifically Continental tires. We're learning a lot about treads and different compounds less and it's it's really important when you go out to buy tires you know what you're doing who doesn't want to be an educated consumer and we're lucky to have marco rubello who is here and telling us about what's going on at continental and the different types of treads and you know if you have a performance car or maybe it's just your everyday driver what to what to get and we've talked a little bit about the extreme contact force which is a grippy tire for the track, but it's okay for the street. And Marco, now we want to move on to the extreme contact sport, which uh, is a little bit more of an everyday tire that you can also track, right? That is correct. So that extreme contact sport is your uh, next step. So like you said, the, the extreme contact force is a tire that is for the track and you can drive it on the road. Now the extreme contact uh, sport is a tire that you can use on your daily driver and you can track it every now and then. We say if you track three, four times a year, you can have uh, extreme contact uh, sport on your daily driver and go to the track. It's an outperforming tire on the track. It has been in One Lap America. It's the tire that we use for the BMW uh, performance driving school. Wow. So every BMW okay. in that performance driving school that you drive either in thermal or in South Carolina facility, they all are on the extreme contact sport. So that tells a lot about the tire. So, for example, this would be a good tire. We use Corvette again, but it's a good car to use because it's one you could track or it's one, it's a touring car too. You can take it on a trip. So maybe if you say, you know what, I take my Corvette to the track every once in a while, but majority of trips I like to drive, take a long drive down to Florida or something. This might be a better bet for you as far as where and wet performance, right? With the situation you said, it would be the perfect tire for them. Actually, there's a lot of people with the C8 that they are doing their upfitments or their normal OE fitments with this tire. And like you said, you're driving down to Florida to take vacation often on your Corvette and enjoying the weather there. And then you want to come up to uh, Georgia and go track over there close to Atlanta. It's the perfect tire for that. Yeah, yeah. And what makes it, what makes it better in the rain, let's say, than, uh, than the force? If we go back to the picture, so you see how on this tire we have three longitudinal grooves instead of two. Mm -hmm. So when you are in a thick film of water, let's say it's raining and there's some uh, standing water, then it helps you for your aqua planning. So it throws the water out of the tread and evacuates all through those water channels that you three, see through the tire. On the extreme contact force, because you want to put more rubber to the ground to put all that traction on, you have less void. Void is uh, the amount of void that you literally have on the tire. So that's why it is better for wet and upper planning. Yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously you can go pretty high speed on the wet with this tire. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not advocating doing that unless you are a good driver, but still um, it's an everyday tire. So if you hit, you know, a little rain uh, on the interstate and you're doing 70, it's going to, you know, it's going to keep you safe. Uh, that is so, right. And yeah. in Continental, uh, we focus a lot on wet performance. Um, you encounter when it starts raining situations that you really need the performance of the tire. Uh, you need that additional braking power. You need that uh, additional um, wet handling. And that's why we have had um, a lot of focus on that through through history, the history of the brand. Uh, and we use a special compound called the Black Chili Compound. We use it on our tires. We use it on um, bicycle tires, uh, motorcycle tires, and uh, UHP tires. Hmm. We are talking to Marco Rubello from Continental. And so now let's talk about another tire with a different name. It is the DWS06. Uh, and that would be the third tire there on the right. Completely different tread. It's got kind of cross hatch. It's actually very kind of artistic looking. Almost looks like the globe or something going around there. Uh, now tell us about this tire. What's the best use for that? One of our best sellers, like you mentioned, the pattern. People really, really love the pattern. And uh, we just did, we just uh, recently launched a couple of months ago, the DWS 06 Plus, which is this one that you see. 
Uh, we did not deviate too much away from that uh, old uh, DWS 06 pattern because how much feedback we had that people love it. This tire is a tire that I would say if you live in north of the U.S., somewhere that it snows, and you want to have a tire all year long, this is your tire. The reason for it is it has a great snow handling, and it also has that characteristics of a UHP tire. Of course, not as good as the Extreme Contact Sport because by the nature of the tire, the Extreme Contact Sport is a summer tire and it's more sporty, but this is a UHP tire and it can handle UHP performance. So, and it has that addition of the winter performance for when you hit a day of snow or you live in a place that you have a winter conditions. So when you want to take your, uh, your A8 uh, skiing and <laughs> put the ski racks right. on top, you could uh, put on a set of DW SO6s because um, it, it's still a, a, a speed rated tire, but, it's, but it is good for snow or precipitation, I guess you would say. Right, Marco? I will give you the perfect example. I have a Porsche Cayman S and I have the Extreme Contact Sport mm -hmm. because I will never take it up to the mountains to go on a winter day. Mm -hmm. And then I have my daily driver, which is it's a 330i BMW which sometimes when it's snowing, it's good snow here up in the mountains two hours away, and I put my snowboard on the back, I have the DWS 06, um, and it performs awesome. I make it there, I make it back safe. Wow. And what's the difference um, in in the ride uh, quality between that tire and the previous one? I assume the, the, uh, tra the sidewall is a little more compliant so uh, the ride quality, actually, we just tested it again. We, we knew the performance, but we uh, got it verified by a third party, which is Tire Reviews. And the DWS06 has the best um, noise and comfort of all three. Mm -hmm. But the Extreme Contact Sport is very close to it. Mm -hmm. So for being a, a summer UHP tire, it has great comfort capabilities. That that's cool, and wow. and we should say a summer tire doesn't mean like when it rains you have to go out and take your tires off. No, it no, can no. handle rain. It's just that it's better to not take a tire like that, let's say, into um, you know a snow a snowstorm or slush or things like that. Would that be right, Marco? Yes, that would be right. Yeah. you don't you do not want to take this tire on winter conditions. Uh, ice, uh, slush, nose, extreme contact sport, don't. Yeah, yeah, exciting stuff. Now, oh, go ahead. Also, uh, there's one more thing, so, since we want to get geeky or technical here. Uh, on UHP summer tires, temperature means a lot. And when you have a big drop in temperature on a tire like this, the extreme contact sport, the compound gets very hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you think about it, the more you heat a tire that you take to the track or a summer tire, it has a very good performance because it starts gripping to the ground. So when you're in snow and the compound starts getting harder, then you lose grip. Right. It is a summer tire. The right. name says it all. You're right. not supposed to take it to winter conditions. We're quickly running out of time here, but uh, where should people go if they want more information on these tires that want to learn even more? Uh, we're not going to give them your phone number because you could fill them in, but where, where should they go? What's a good website for them to go to? So there's many websites that are, are there. Uh, there's many online tire companies that do testing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, companies like the one I mentioned, Tire Reviews with a Y, that we're doing a lot of educational videos. We have done a lot of off-road. We're doing this one if you want to decide between a track tire, between uh, a 200 UTKG, a uh, summer UHP tire, or a... Uh, all season UHP tire and that video is going to be public in uh, two weeks and we're coming more and more and more to educate everybody because there's a lot of questions even myself when I was not in the tire industry I asked myself all these questions mm -hmm. and that's why we're coming with more videos and if you have any requests uh, you can always uh, contact us I'm open with my uh, social media so I'm very connected to the tire industry well, my well. name on Instagram which is very easy to contact me is Marco Robello and the tag name is M Robello uh, feel free to shoot a message, then I can direct you to right pages. Um, anything you need, great. our webpage, online, you can go and check third party testing. Exactly. Excellent. Well, Marco Rebello from Continental, we appreciate it. Lots of great information. 
we will uh, have to have you back to talk a little bit about <laughs> more tire talk. So thank you very much. And it's time for me to say I'm Fred Staub. I'm Les Jackson. We're going to see you down the road. <laughs>